Coming up in today's newscast, Israeli jets strike in Syria as Netanyahu meets with Putin, dozens of Syrians seek treatment in Israeli hospitals, and the comedian strikes again, an American congressman says Sasha Baron Cohen tricked him into an interview using a fake award about his support for Israel. Following yesterday's encroachment of a Syrian drone into Israeli airspace, Israel's air force has just conducted a series of counter-strikes in southern Syria. IDF officials have confirmed that at least three military sites belonging to the Assad regime have been targeted in the early morning hours. These tensions are unfolding, perhaps with purpose, with Prime Minister Netanyahu currently in Moscow for talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. At this time, it seems clear that the IDF initially hesitated roughly 15 minutes before downing yesterday's drone with a Patriot missile. This delay, which gave the unarmed drone enough time to fly six miles into Israeli territory, was likely used by Israeli officials to clear the attack through Russia first. Netanyahu has made it very clear that the focus of his talks with the Russian president today will focus on removing Iran from Israel's border, as well as minimizing the Syrian threat. Many believe that given Netanyahu's close ties with Putin, there may indeed be some sort of compromise on the horizon here. But while a full Iranian pullout is unlikely, Putin may agree to some of Netanyahu's demands if Israel should help lift American sanctions placed on Russia. The United States set those sanctions in response to Moscow's illegal occupation then annexation of the Crimea Peninsula from Ukraine. Russia has, for the most part, tolerated Israeli counterattacks against Putin's Syrian ally. But at the same time, the Russian president has armed Assad's forces with a fresh arsenal of deadly medium-range missiles. Needless to say, the two leaders certainly have plenty to discuss in today's high-stakes meeting. Well, a special Knesset committee has now been called following a slew of accusations between the Netanyahu family and the Lahav 433 anti-corruption police unit. This committee will be discussing the sexual assault allegations against the unit's former commander, Roni Rittman, as well as any bearing on whether or not this impacted the ongoing corruption investigations and again, against the Prime Minister and his wife, Sarah. And here now with more on this is Editor-in-Chief of Mida, Ziv Mao, and Yariv Oppenheimer, a board member and former director of Peace Now. Thank you both. So much for joining us. Now, the update here is that the attorney general has already banned law enforcement officials from attending this meeting. You know the obvious um, conflict of interest here, possible. Um, um, you know, sub ob there's obvious reasons why. Do you feel this was a smart move, bad move? First of all, this is an illegal move according to Israeli law. To when, not have police there. No, this is an illegal move for them not to come, and the banning or the boycott of the mm -hmm. of the of the GA of the committee is illegal because according to the law, once an official is being called to a committee of the Knesset, he must come. According to the law, the only person entitled to exempt an official for not coming is the minister that supervises him. Mendelblit is not a minister. He is subordinate to Ayelet Shaked, who is the Minister of Justice, who mm -hmm. did not make a decision. Thus, this decision is, is, is illegal, and time will decide uh, whether or not a Mendelbeet will pay a price for his illegal decision. Uh, as to the merits of the stuff, let's put things in context. We have a high officer of the police that uh, is accused of sexual harassing another uh, a female officer in his unit, and this is the topic. This is basically the topic. This is what um, we must discuss. These are the people who are investigating Netanyahu, right. and, whether or and not this that is what the Knesset needs and, and would like to uh, to uh, uh, to investigate mm -hmm. in service of the people that are interested to know whether or not there is a conflict of interest on behalf of this officer who accuses Netanyahu for uh, for, for uh, fabricating this mm -hmm. investigation, this mm -hmm. sexual harassment investigation against the officer. This is the topic at hand. So the topic should be what is going on in the police. How come the commissioner of the police is allowing for such an officer to hold in office for so long. Mm. The issue here is actually we have two things. We have the first thing is that the Netanyahu investigation. And we need to look at this investigation and to see the finding of this investigation. The police is not an op-ed. They are not just saying their views. Mm. They need to show evidence. They mm. need to show questions and answer and to show that there is contradiction or people are telling the truth. This is the goal of the police. And we cannot all the time, and this is the method of the right wing, not to speak about the issue 
issue, but to speak about the general picture and to find some excuses to conflict of interest. I'm not care of that. I'm care, first of all, what are the evidence and what will be the decision of the legal system mm. according to what the police achieve. There is another thing, another issue, and this is the issue of the sexual harassment. Mm. This is not a political issue. This is not the, pol the issue for the members of Knesset. And the fact is that the Likud members of Knesset are using this issue in order to try to cancel the investigation against Netanyahu. Put these two issues aside and don't uh, uh, try to use the things that this officer did in order to uh, lead diligently sure. well, the, the investigation of Netanyahu. These issues are indeed aside. This committee did not seek to undermine the findings of the police. It's, it was looking into whether or not the officer in charge was uh, uh, himself contained with, uh, with double standard. This well, is what let's, was looking let's into. Let's be honest, it's, it's, without it's interesting, the, the interesting investigation of Netanyahu, these members of Knesset will never talk about this issue. And by the way, there will not be any statement by the legal advisor saying don't talk about sexual harassment. But the use, the try to use the sexual harassment in order to challenge the Netanyahu investigation, this is wrong, this is false, this is a, a, a something that should not happen, especially when the people that are a, politicians are calling officers to a committee to speak about it in a political uh, situation that these police people are not political and don't push them in order to they become well, political. I want to ask one question here because we are running out of time. This is, of course, a very complicated, deep issue with a lot of history. You brought up something interesting about evidence. What evidence is on the table that this this scandal may have impacted investigations or not? Is there any evidence that we know of? So basically for now? the officer himself have claimed, and uh, this was just published this weekend in, uh, in our Alex newspaper, mm -hmm. he claimed that uh, Netanyahu fabricated the investigation against him, against the officer. Claims. Said. Claims. He, cl okay. he, he is the claims. one who's claiming. Okay. Now this very claim, once proven, and it is at least publicly, if not legally proven, mm -hmm. once those claims are on the table, this person is Without a doubt, within conflict of interest. Now, this was well, known in to the commission. But again, but again no. I'm asking the evidence. When, the claims, evidence. when the claims were given, I mean, yeah, it, it, it was because was, this is what he thought. It was published. By the way. It, it was published this weekend, but the claims was given months ago, and he, he, he only left office this January. And there is no doubt is, that the police commission is backing him up, backing up doing again, this. Yeah. Is it relevant to the finding of the police? Do you, can, can, how, even, let's, yes. let's say that it's true. Yes. Eventually the police, again, they're not saying the views. They're talking about evidence. And if there are no evidence against Netanyahu, the police cannot just create evidence yeah, you from speak as from if criminal from just, justice is mathematics. As if there is only one result to whatever given, and you know better it's than not, that. But it's about, also, it's about evidence, and it's about facts. So and and the then, question, by the way, you can interpret it, the fact, and you can say this is why this is not by this is legitimate this is not the, the the role of the police is not to make the final decision the role of the police is to bring the map to show what happened to show what were the answers of the questions that were, were being guys, asked we can to show evidence and with all due respect I, mean, I think sorry, it's sorry, guys, of mistrust against the police against, I'm, against I'm, the I'm, attorney I'm, and against I'm, the police I'm sorry to cut this off we could obviously talk about this forever and there's a lot that's probably yet to unfold here I'm sure we'll be seeing both of you guys very soon to talk about that thank you both thank you thank you a breaking update just now, the Knesset's discussion concerning this possible conflict of interest in the police anti-corruption unit has been cancelled. Though the committee did meet, this particular subject, which explores whether or not the former police chief of Lahav 433 anti-corruption unit was influenced by the sexual harassment allegations against him, was left off the schedule. Israel's attorney general slammed the entire debate in the first place, saying that the discussion could amount to obstruction into the investigations of alleged corruption by the prime minister and his wife. But the Netanyahu's legal team say that the former police chief had it out for them from the very beginning, accusing him of blaming the sexual harassment claims on the prime minister. M.K. Yoav Kish, who initially set the meeting, has slammed Attorney General Mendel Blitz's criticisms. Kish says that he will work to establish an independent commission on the matter and circumvent law enforcement agencies if necessary. Well, an unusual and truly disturbing kidnapping case is quickly escalating into a national crisis. Earlier this week, a seven-year-old boy from a city in central Israel was kidnapped in broad daylight by masked captives. Sometime later, the family of the child received a ransom demand from the kidnappers, demanding over a million dollars. At this time, the child's whereabouts are still unknown, though police have just announced that four suspects have been arrested in connection to this horrible crime. Making this all the more macabre is the fact that the abduction of seven-year-old Karim Junho 
was caught on tape, but investigators seem to be divided on the motive. Some sources say that Karim's abduction is linked to the family's unpaid debts to a crime syndicate. Others report that he may have been kidnapped in response to an unresolved financial fight within the boy's own relatives. Rumors of a deal between Israeli police and the child's kidnappers surfaced sometime yesterday, perhaps preempting the arrest of these four suspects today. But for now, details are scarce. Police are continuing their search for little Karim with helicopters, checkpoints, and interrogations, but at this time, his whereabouts remain unknown. Thankfully, he is believed to be in good health and unharmed. Needless to say, the story has captured the attention and hearts of the entire nation who are praying for Kareem's safe return as soon as possible. Well, the Intel company is mostly known for their cutting-edge computer chips, processors, and servers. But Intel CEOs are hoping to crack another crucial frontier and bring the world into the new era of 5G technology. Well, it turns out that the team behind this revolutionary upgrade is based in Intel's R&D department right here in Israel. This would be a seriously game-changing upgrade, one that has eluded tech companies for years, by the way. Compared with the current 4G standard, a 5G network would see 30 to 50 times faster download speeds. Translation, instead of hours or even minutes, you could download an entire season of your favorite TV show in 4K resolution in mere seconds. And that kind of speed boost would open up a whole new era of possibilities for our digital world. At a time when just about everything is linked to the cloud, a 5G network could rewrite the rules for how scientists develop our phones, our computers, hey, maybe even our cars. The minds at Intel are even thinking one step ahead. Imagine a cloud-based refrigerator that can tell you when you're running low on OJ. The Israeli team at Intel's Holy Land offices are reportedly leading the charge for the jump to 5G. That makes sense given the number of Israeli firms Intel has gobbled up over the years. As of now, Intel is probably the single largest employer of tech jobs in the country, with almost 11,000 Israeli employees to date. The company has sunk close to $35 billion into Israel's economy. Hey, if it can help me stream my Netflix a little faster, I'd say that it's worth every last penny. One of the most cutting-edge, precise medical diagnoses possible? Well, look no further than the mines at Zebra. The Israeli startup that takes its name from the black and white striped animal has developed a new AI system that can read CTs and X-rays. And their breakthrough algorithm has just been awarded FDA approval and promises a new breakthrough in preventing the risk of heart disease. The team at Zebra Medical Vision can now analyze a patient's scans to accurately detect the amount of calcium located in the coronary artery. The technology pulls the calcium score from an accurate CT scan with an artificially intelligent algorithm, helping doctors anticipate the risk of disease in the artery. Over time, excess calcium in the body can build up in our most critical passageways and arteries, a potentially dangerous condition that can indicate a slew of heart diseases or coronary microvascular conditions. As with many conditions, early detection is often the most crucial part of any treatment. And on top of the potentially life-saving stakes here, this is also one of the first AI-based technologies to win the approval of the FDA. The first of many more to come, according to Zebra's CEO, Elad Benyamin. Such a move to automated medical tools might not only prove effective, but also significantly cheaper for the common patient too. Even though Zebra will now be expanding their efforts into the United States, the technology might help drive down healthcare costs for Israeli subsidies medical carriers in an age where affordable health care and equal access to that health care remains something of a debate in the United States this zebra is certainly leading the pack in terms of bringing affordable solutions to all not everyone sees baldness as a curse and I got to admit many people actually rock the bare scalp look with style but for those of us who love our locks like myself and hope never to lose them like myself a cure for baldness sounds pretty darn good well here in Israel Everything is possible, and joining with me now is Dr. Meir Baev, a researcher and therapist in the treatment of baldness from the Dr. Meyer Clinic. Guys, you'll probably want to listen up to this one. Dr. Meyer, thank you for joining us. What is this treatment? How does it prevent or restore hair? How does it work? Okay, so the treatment is called platelet-rich plasma, or PRP. Okay. And the treatment is uh, geniusly simple. We uh, withdraw a blood, we use the blood of, uh, of the patient, his own blood. We draw the blood, um, we centrifuge it, we apply a kind of an energy that separates types of cells. We take only the thrombocytes, which are the cells that are responsible for hair restoration, and we inject them back to the scalp with a specific technique, no pain technique, painless. Okay. 
uh, and uh, those uh, thrombocytes release gross factors uh, that are responsible for hair restoration. It's a process that takes time. Okay, wow. and it, uh, yeah. You're essentially and, growing hair back from, yeah, from square the, one, but with your yeah. own cells, so it's totally organic, right? Yeah, it's There's to no chemicals. Totally, totally organic, no chemicals at all. Okay, I've got to ask, like, there's a lot of stories in old wives' tales about where baldness comes from, how to anticipate if you're going to have baldness. What is the source of baldness exactly? Is it genetic, hereditary? Okay, so most of the baldness is genetic, and mm. there's a hormone that participates in uh, this process. It's called testosterone. It's actually okay. the male hormone, but females also have it. Of course. And uh, what it does, it gradually diminishes the blood supply to the follicles and uh, the follicles gradually disappear. That's the, the main reason. Uh, and the reason is genetic. Okay. I heard once, tell me if I'm wrong, that you can tell if you're going to be bald based on your grandfather from your mother's side. Is that the case? Okay. Or is that a ridiculous story that I tell myself <laughs> that I'm going to have this hair forever? Uh, it's not exactly the case because it's much more complex than we say okay. than you said, and um, there's many many factors and many genes that per participate in that. So there is no way to predict who will become bald gotcha. according to their ancestors. There is no such a way. Gotcha. Cool. And it looks like this treatment is very far along. I see a lot of successful tests. It looks like already you guys have done amazing work, and I have a feeling all of our men are going to be very excited to see what we have in store. Thank you so much for joining us, doctor. Sure. So what happens when you put the creator of Alien together with the story of the origin of mankind? Well, we're about to find out. The Oscar-nominated director will be produced in the Hollywood adaptation of Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. The book was written by best-selling Israeli historian and author Yuval Noah Hagheli. To date, the book has sold over 8 million copies and has been translated into nearly 30 languages worldwide. Hariri's non-fiction saga covers the development of human evolution from primate into Homo sapien. He initially wrote the book thinking it would be a textbook that his students at the Hebrew University could use to study from. Instead, the book swept the literary scene by surprise, quickly topping the bestsellers list when it debuted back in 2011. And obviously it caught the attention of Hollywood too. The visionary director behind Blade Runner, Gladiator, and The Counselor will be producing the feature film adaptation through his production banner, Scott Free. Director duties will be overseen by Asif Kapadia, who won the Oscar for Best Documentary in 2015 for his portrait of the late Jewish singer-songwriter Amy Winehouse. Even though Kapadia is perhaps best known for his documentary work, the filmmaker recently directed two episodes of the Netflix original series Mindhunter for David Fincher, which means that maybe Sapiens could become a documentary, a narrative feature film, a miniseries, who knows? According to the book's author, the film version will hopefully blend science, fiction, history, drama, and genius to tell the incredible story of man's origins. Along those lines, I'd say it sounds like this adaptation is in the perfect creative hands. Sasha Baron Cohen in his forthcoming Showtime series is getting all kinds of publicity lately, and it hasn't even premiered yet. The Oscar-nominated creator of Borat, Bruno, and Ali G has been secretly filming a new TV series for the better part of a year now, one that subversively embeds the comedian deep undercover in American politics. Well, one of Cohen's apparent victims is former Illinois GOP Congressman Joe Walsh, who now claims that Cohen tricked him into an interview by saying that they were presenting him with an award for his support of Israel. Cohen infamously exploded into the mainstream with the success of the feature film Borat. That film disguised the comedian as a well-meaning but pretty hapless immigrant from Kazakhstan and revealed some hilarious, if bitter, truths about racism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia in modern America. Former congressman-turned-radio host Joe Walsh seems to have fallen for a gag along those lines. Walsh has revealed on social media that Cohen's producers flew him out to D.C. on the promise of honoring him alongside Tony Blair, Rupert Murdoch, and Steven Spielberg for his allegiance to Israel. Indeed, the Republican spent much of his political career advocating for the Jewish state. As a radio host, however, Walsh was faced with some criticism for using racially charged language on air, allegedly inciting violence, and supposedly anti-Islamic remarks. Ironically, Walsh's tale reveals more about the forthcoming series than any promotion for it thus far. According to Walsh, he was told he'd be participating in a pre-interview celebrating Israel's 70th birthday, but soon the interviewer, presumably Cohen in some sort of disguise, began to ask him if children should defend themselves against terror attacks. 
Walsh's tale comes just a day after yet another public figure announced that they'd been duped by Cohen, former vice presidential nominee Sarah Palin. Palin says that Cohen was dressed up as a war veteran at the time, complete with a wheelchair in what she calls a sick attempt at humor. Now, it remains to be seen just how much Palin or Walsh gave away in their interview, but a recently released teaser for the show has shown us a bit of what we can expect. In the clip, Cohen can be heard asking former Vice President Dick Cheney to sign his waterboard kit, which Cheney on camera happily does. Politics aside, I gotta say that is rather impressive. Here now to help us cool off this summer is ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh with her top five rooftop bars in Israel. Take it away, girl. The summer heat in Israel can get pretty brutal, even though you'll still see most people spending their days at the beach and mainly in the ocean. But at night, it definitely cools down a bit. So what better way to spend your Israeli summer than parting it up on a cool rooftop bar? That's why I'm here to give you guys the top five rooftop bars to check out. Number one is Speakeasy in Tel Aviv, located on one of the trendiest streets in the city, Rothschild. This is definitely the place to get a perfect view of the street that hosts the most amount of nightlife, but the view isn't what'll make you stay. There are a variety of different cocktails, homemade berry gin that pairs perfectly with their delicious dishes will definitely be, but don't take my word for it, come try it out yourself. Second on our list is Esperanto. Now, I can tell you this from experience, this is definitely the bar slash restaurant you are gonna wanna get to right before sunset. Located on a large wooden deck facing the stunning Mediterranean seafront. This is definitely the place to go for a classy night out to munch on delicious and stunningly plated food and of course, to cool down by the water with a nice breeze. Nothing better than that. Sura Mare is third on our list, and rightfully so. This is one of the Tel Aviv's most glamorous rooftop bars with an unbelievable view. The stylish spot offers a mix of tasty snacks with an Italian influence and of course, insanely creative cocktails. But let's get real, the dazzling views of the city skyline is definitely the reason for a visit. Fourth up is the Poly House. This boutique hotel hosts both guests and locals alike on their Carmel Market adjacent rooftop bar for both bottle service and of course, good vibes. Custom cocktails are offered with top shelf bottles and small tapas dishes like tuna tartare. Make sure to hang out by the infinity pool and admire the view of the city of Tel Aviv. Last but of course not least, the Mimila Hotel Rooftop Lounge, the only one on the list in Jerusalem. Naturally, people come to sip on signature drinks and sample unique appetizers, but they ultimately stay for the view of the ancient city walls that overlook the city of Jerusalem. That's all for today's top five, back to you. I like to think of myself as an accomplished constructor of all things Lego related. But then I saw the newest exhibit about to open at the new Lego park in the city of Cholon, and I realized just how much I still had yet to learn. The park's Women Through the Block exhibit is kicking off its debut with a very special series of portraits, 30 Israeli women sculpted entirely from Lego blocks. As you can see here, the result is bizarrely an awesome and pretty recognizable. Hoping to attract audiences of all ages, the curators at the Cholon Lego Park opted to put strong, independent Israeli women front and center for the opening exhibit. Familiar faces include prominent celebs like Eurovision winner Netta Barzilai, as well as Wonder Woman star Gal Gadot and supermodel Bar Raffaelli. But you can also see the faces of a few Israeli politicians, including the Prime Minister's wife, Sarah Netanyahu, and Justice Minister Ayel Shaked. LEGO artists sculpted each portrait almost like an 8-bit rendering using 4,500 individual LEGO pieces and blocks, building it block by block. Personally, I cannot wait to check this park out for myself when it opens on July 14th. The opening exhibit also showcases a detailed rendering of a futuristic Israeli city. I just want to say right now that I actually built a futuristic version of the city of Washington, D.C. when I was 10, but I have a feeling that theirs is going to be a lot more impressive than mine was. The Hebrew Word of the Day is brought to you by IDC Samru Ulpan, open to everyone. And now for our Hebrew Word of the Day, Lego artists are portraying prominent Israeli women in the city of Cholon's new Lego park. And that's why today's word is Pesel, or sculpture. Now maybe you already presumed this about me, but I do confess I am a creature of vanity, and someday I'd like a Pesel, or a sculpture of myself, adorning every door from of my house. No, make that two Pesalim. I'm willing to give up on the expensive marble though. How about a Pesel made out of Nutella? I can get behind that. All right, on that note, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be warm with partly cloudy skies with a low of 77 or 25 degrees Celsius. And tomorrow you can expect more partly cloudy skies and warm weather with a high of 86 or 30 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.65 shekels to the American dollar. 
And remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Brett Allen Smith, and thank you for watching.